Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 1 through 10. And uh, the, the title is, We All Profit from Having a Prophet. And I believe that each and every one of us has benefited and probably still needs a prophetic word in our life. We all need someone who's willing to call us on our mess. That we need someone to speak truth into a situation where maybe our vision is blurred. And so we all profit from having a prophet. But we live in a world, and if you go to the next slide, that kind of has this attitude. Change my life, but don't make me change me. Right? I, I, I want my blood pressure to go down, but don't take my bacon burgers away. Right? You know, I, I, I want to get bigger and stronger, but don't make me go to the gym every day. We get these kind of things. I, I want to save money, but I also want to uh, keep Amazon afloat. You know, we kind of get into all those kind of things. And so we kind of are in that, we can get caught up in that. Change my life. I want my life to change. But don't make me change me. But the truth of the matter is, if I want my life to change, there are going to have to be some things that I have to leave behind. And maybe there's some disciplines and and some things that I have to pick up on. And so I have to be focused more on character than pleasure. I need to be focused more on uh, what is good and best rather than what is really good right now. And so we struggle with that. Change my life, but don't make me change me. And one of the things that I've seen in the postmodern gospel and what we see uh, out there with a lot of the popular movements is this, is that uh, we kind of have a self-focused praise and worship. If you listen to the the popular praise and worship songs today, it spends a lot more time talking about how I feel about God than praising God for his attributes, his word, and his judgments. We praise God for his judgments. Oh my gosh, why would we praise God for his judgments? Because he's righteous and holy, and that's an incredible thing. And somehow, out of his righteousness and his holiness, he has paved a way for you and I to be in fellowship with him. And so the focus of praise and worship can be more focused on self than on honoring God. Well, you know, the band just really wasn't on today, and the lights weren't as bright, and this, you know, I just didn't get the shiver down my spine. Well, maybe you don't need an excited hair on the back of your neck experience. Maybe you need... Uh, come to Jesus and let's talk about what's going on in your heart and your mind and your attitudes and your relationships. The other thing that I, I see in this is that there's a focus on God's promises, but not recognizing that all of God's promises have conditions. We want God to heal our land, and he'll do that. But we have to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. Well, I can humble. Oh, yeah, I'll humble myself. Well, I'll pray. I'll try to seek his face. But, man, that turn from my wicked ways, that can be a deal breaker, can't it? And so you think of it. We want the promises. We claim the promises. We claim the prosperity but we don't recognize the conditions of God's promise. God's promises are generally if then. If you come to me, I'll bless you. If you run from me, don't expect to be blessed. If you hold on to things that I've said are profane and evil and and sinful, and you hold on to that, then you're choosing that over me. Don't expect for the miracles of grace to be poured out upon you. That they're conditional in that. We also talk about, there tends to be, oh, God's grace, God's grace, and I love God's grace. I stand here before you by God's grace. We're all saved by God's grace. But grace uh, demands repentance and responsibility. 
See, Jesus didn't say, I will forgive you of all your sins and just go back to business as usual. No, he said, if any man would come after me, if he's going to follow me, let him take up his cross. Let him deny himself. Let him deny his flesh and what his flesh desires for what God desires. And the, the other thing is, and this is, I think this is a very American thing, and it might be elsewhere as well, but we tend to want to remake God in our image instead of offering life surrender. Well, if I'm for this, God must be for this. If I think this is okay, then God must think it's okay. You'll hear people, well, if God was a loving God, how could he? Or if God is a just God, how could he? Well, I'm, not, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm a lot more or a lot less loving and a lot less just than God. And comparing myself to him or putting, trying to put parameters on that, that he has to meet my approval, I've got things completely backwards. And so as we look at that, we, we need that prophetic voice in our life, that voice that calls us back. You and I, if we go to the next slide, you and I need a prophetic presence in our lives. We need a prophetic presence in our lives. Now, the good news is God has left a prophetic presence in your life. It's called the Bible. You can see his word proclaimed. The Bible is a book of law, prophecy, grace, hope, trust, but it speaks into our lives. Maybe you've been struggling and you've been at it and you're thinking, well, this is, you know, you've got this bad attitude and you read the scripture and sometimes... It encourages you, and then sometimes it makes you mad because it points out that you're the problem, you know, uh, and we, we get on that. Well, that's the, the Bible is speaking into your life as you read it, and, and those words come alive on that. It's speaking in that. We need that prophetic presence in our lives. So when Jesus came to prepare the people for the earth-changing, world-changing, paradigm-altering, uh, life-changing things that would happen because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what Jesus continues to do, the people in Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem needed a prophetic presence to prepare the way for the Lord. And so that's where we get to John the Baptist. Now, if you talk, go back and read about uh, the, the prophecy of John's birth, he would be one who uh, would come with the spirit of Elijah, that he would be one that would be out there in the wilderness uh, and be out there outside of the norm and, and uh, would say the, the things that nobody really wanted to hear. And that's pretty much uh, what we see. So let's take a look at, at this passage about John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. Verses 1 through 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near, has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. And then he describes John. He had a camel hair garment and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. He did not look like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the scholars sitting in the temple in Jerusalem or in the synagogues in the, in the towns and villages around Galilee. Um, he, he might have looked, I have a vision in my head, but my description might not be appropriate. You know, he might look like a deadhead, who knows, you know. Uh, you, you just, you, you just, uh, but you think about this, here he is out in the wilderness. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to him. And I want you to look at verse 6. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Did you see that? They were baptized as they confessed their sins. So I want to look at this repentance in the wilderness. The repentance in the wilderness. He says, go ahead, the next one here. Repent because the kingdom of God 
is near. That we should repent in anticipation and in preparation for the coming Messiah. And so he's saying, this is coming your way. You need to start turning from sin and self and from the, the ritual and prepare yourselves for the one who is coming. Get ready. The kingdom of God is coming. And it was a prophetic world word that was previously prophesied. If you look at that, he quotes uh, Isaiah 43, a prophecy of Yahweh. He says... Uh, uh, repent because the kingdom of comes, has come, uh, come near. And they said, he's the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. So Isaiah 43 is a prophecy of Yahweh, prepare the way of the Lord and, and make a quick and easy access to God. But now John, John is making this prophecy about Jesus. Now, do you see that he's pointing out the divinity of Jesus? He applies it to Jesus and asserts that divinity. So the prophecy about God, the Father, is now said this is the prophecy. It translates to Jesus, the divine Messiah, the divine Son of God. And as he comes on this, as he comes in this, is that uh, he says, make quick and easy access to God. Well, what did Jesus do for those who believe in him? He provides access to the throne of God. He provides access to salvation. He provides access to God's grace and forgiveness. He gave, provides access to God's Holy Spirit that empowers and enables and equips, convicts, guides us, strengthens us, empowers us. Make straight the way of the Lord. <clears throat> Repentance is the proper response to God's grace. Repentance is the proper response to God's grace. What does he say? Hey, listen, God's coming your way. He's ready to pour out his grace on you. You need to turn from the world and turn to him. You turn from, you turn from all this mess and you need to turn to him. It's going to be a change of direction. It's going to be a change of character. It's going to be a change of your desires. It's going to be a change of focus. That now my focus is not just, it's not me and what I want in the moment, but now I want my focus to be on what does God desire? What will honor God? How can I make a difference for God's kingdom in this world? How can I impact lives with the love of Jesus Christ? And I want you to also go back and look at verse 6. Go to the next slide, please. It says, they baptized as they confessed their sins, not as they condoned their sins. We all have a tendency to want to justify our actions as we condemn the actions of others. It said, they baptized as they confessed their sins, not that they condoned their sins. One of the things I struggle with is, is guys coming and they want to be baptized. They want to be baptized. And I want to know, how many times have you been baptized? I mean, uh, people will put up here, sign up for baptism. Well, guys will sign up every three months to be baptized. Thinking that that event is going to cause them to turn a corner. And then, but it's, no, it's really kind of a band-aid on a bullet hole. It's, a, it's one of those things where I feel good in the moment and it's a high, you know, it's a mile post. But it's supposed to be something that you do to signify a life change, that you identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Not something that makes you feel good like you've done something to be good with Christ. It says they confess their sins, that they admitted their guilt. See, the best way to come to Jesus is to admit our guilt, confess our sins, and surrender our lives to him. If you try to come to Jesus from a position of power, you're missing the point. I am powerless in sin. And so I surrender my life to Jesus so that he can take care of that for me. We confess, they confess their sins, not condone their sins. Look down at verse 7 through 9. 
Now, what happened when the religious people showed up? It was one thing when all these guys from out here in the country, when all the bumpkins showed up, that's one thing. And yeah, they needed to get right. You know, look at you. You're, yeah, you need to get right. But what about when the fancy people from town and their flowing robes and they had memorized scripture and they had been to this and they had sat under this teacher and they could, you know, they... Uh, they could tell you uh, all, all these wonderful things. And, and John was so impressed with them that he greeted them warmly. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism, he said to them, you brutal vipers, you rotten snakes, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And I want you to really focus in on verse 8. This is a very, very important verse. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Now I want to fast forward to the book of Galatians where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Think about this. The fruit of the Spirit, for most of us, is consistent with some pretty major changes in our hearts and our attitudes and our behavior. Patience, kindness, compassion, gentleness. You know, we live in a world that tells you that you should come in like a wrecking ball. And the Bible is saying, no, produce fruit consistent with repentance, love, mercy, forgiveness. Kindness, gentleness, thanksgiving, gratitude. It's never enough. No, man, I've got more than enough. God's taking care of me. He's providing. And so we look at this. He says, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Now, as he says this, he goes on in verse 9 and 10. He says, don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I would point out to you that Jesus will repent, re repeat this in John chapter 15. And so... He talks about repentance for the religious, that we produce fruit. And go to the next one, please. Fruit consistent with repentance. It means a change of heart. It means a change of character. It means a change of purpose. It means a change of allegiance. Now, I grew up every morning in school saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. If you're an old coot like me, you might have had that experience. And so you, you see that. But you know, my allegiance is to the kingdom of God. My allegiance needs to be to the cross of Calvary. That is my highest calling and my greatest, that, that's my greatest cause. My allegiance needs to be with Jesus and he tells them, don't rely on religion or religious activity. Your heritage of faith is not important, as important as your practice of faith. Well, we're the children of Abraham. My dad was a Baptist preacher. My granddad was a Baptist preacher. Crying out loud, I was born in a Baptist hospital on Easter Sunday. I think dad preached that morning too. I think he, oh, he's good. He's got a bump on his head. We'll see you later, you know. But, you know, we can claim that heritage, but it's not their faith. It's got to be your faith. Don't rely on your ritual. I mean, you can, it doesn't matter which direction you're praying. You know, I'm facing this direction, I'm praying, I'm doing it five times a day, I'm doing it seven times a day, I'm fasting, I've got a head covering, I've got all these things going on. Hey, but if you're praying to the wrong God, yeah, that's a problem. Well, it has to be just so. And if you cross this, hey, listen, you can bonk me in the head while I'm praying. It's not going to mess up God's ability to hear and answer my prayer. 
Don't get caught up on the ritual. You know, we have our ritual. We have our liturgy. You know every week you're going to get four or five songs. We're going to probably read a scripture. We're going to pray for somebody. You kind of know what to expect. We, we, and it can, become, it can become just, hey, this is who we are, what we do. Right? When I was growing up, um, after they took the offering, they would sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But then we changed it because someone felt like that we were only happy for the money in the plate. And so then they moved it to the start of the service. So we started every service singing the doxology because there were certain people that wanted everyone to know that we're praising God for the whole service, not just that we got a plate full of envelopes. You know, it's a ritual. Rituals don't get you to glory. Now listen, if you can make, there's some, rituals can, can be helpful if they remind you and point you to Christ. But so often we cling to the ritual and we're not offering up repentance. And we're, off, we're not bearing fruit uh, the fruit of repentance in our lives. What about your personal piety? Oh, well, I would never do that. I would never go there. I would never say that. I would never be this. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes our allegiance uh, can, uh, is with the, the ritual or the religion or the heritage. Listen, a lot of times we can get caught up being more American than Christian. He said repentance for the, the religious is you need to produce uh, uh, fruit that is consistent with repentance. And this echoes the prophetic word from Micah, chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give extravagant gifts? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body for my own sin? Man, he is called, mankind, he has called, he has told you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you. And I want you to look at what God's prophet said, act justly, love faithfulness, and walk humbly with your God. It has more to do with being faithful being kind and, and true uh, to act justly uh, and, and just to walk with God. And so uh, as we look at that, we profit from a prophet in our lives. We need a prophet in our lives. Now these, uh, oh, that's better. We've got to get a bigger, we've got to get a bigger monitor in the back because that looks like, you know, I feel like I'm at the eye doctor. Uh, Alina, that's my cheater back there that makes it look like I know what's going on. So, okay. So, uh, what's the difference between David and Solomon? All right, man after God's own heart. Uh, but he was an abject failure at one point in his life, correct? He repented. What happened, though, that led to that repentance? Exactly. See, David in his early life had Samuel as a prophet to guide him. And we need people to mentor us and guide us and disciple us, don't we? And by the way, if you're here this morning, you, it's, you should be one of those people who is mentoring and guiding and discipling. That's where you are. You're not a kid, you're not brand new to the faith. You know, this is your opportunity to mentor, to guide, and to disciple. That's what Samuel, he had that. And then when things went off the rails later in his life, he had Nathan 
And he told him that story. Then David was so mad. He goes, man, I want to find that guy. I'm going to show, I'm going to teach him a lesson. And Nathan said, you the man. You the man. (laughs) But what happened after that? He confessed his sins. He repented. He couldn't undo what was done, but he turned from that. You see, he profited from that prophetic voice. As you read the life of Solomon, you know what you will not find? Any reference to a prophet during the reign of Solomon. So when Solomon went off the rails, there was no one there to call him back. And what generally happens when we go off the rails? We don't just go off the rails. We go off the rails, we go head over hills, we do a couple of flip-flops, we struggle to get up and go back down. And, and, it, and that's kind of what the end of Solomon's life was. We talk about the early part of his life, he was filled with wisdom. And the last part of his life, he was filled with folly. Come on. Now, she's not here, so I feel safe in saying this. I, I struggle to please one woman. I can't imagine have nearly a thousand, right, to tend to. I, that, that just makes no sense. That's not wise, right? But the sad part of that is, is he began to build uh, temples and altars for their gods in God's. And, and as he did that, he began to usher in a new era, a new era of idolatry in the land that would uh, end up with the northern kingdom splitting uh, from them and and being destroyed by the Assyrians about 200 years later and then the southern kingdom struggling with the same issues and being taken out by the Babylonians into exile um, about 140 years after that. We need a prophet in our lives. If you don't have anyone around you, or if you have separated yourself from anybody who had told you, you're wrong, I love you, but you need to get back, then you've done yourself a terrible disservice spiritually. I don't like that preacher. He preaches so negative. Well, if he's telling the truth and you're taking it as negative, guess what, Hoss? He not the one that got the problem. You don't want to hear about the sin in your life that you value more than your relationship with God. You see, we all profit from having that prophetic voice in our lives. John pointed us to bear good fruit therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance in verse 10 he says even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire and Jesus later in John chapter 15 would command the same thing he would say I am the vine you are the branches the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. And if anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they're burned. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So for us in 2024... John gives us two basic things that we can use as a a launching pad. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. And let's bear the fruit of repentance. God changed my character. God changed my focus. God changed my allegiance. God changed my heart. God, let me turn loose of all these things that I'm holding on to that are dragging me down. I just want to, I want to bear the fruit of repentance and walk with you. Repent. Let's bear the fruit of repentance. 
and see what God can do in our lives when we let go of the mess and we follow him.